We're going to turn this morning in God's Word to the book of Psalms, as we've been doing the last couple of weeks, to Psalm 72. Psalm 72, unlike some of the psalms that we've been looking at, all of the psalms that we've been looking at the last number of weeks, is not a psalm of confession, a psalm of penitence, um, but it's a psalm that talks about uh, the rule of Christ in our lives. It's a fitting psalm, I think, for Palm Sunday. And uh, I, it's also a psalm, as I've mentioned, it's long been understood to point forward to Jesus, which is why uh, the song that we sang from uh, Isaac Watts just a few moments ago uh, talks about Jesus reigning where'er the sun does its successive journeys run. And uh, if you have opportunity later on, I invite you to, if you have a hymnal at home or um, if you can follow the bulletin links to the songs that are there, to take a look at the words to the song that we just sang and then set it alongside Psalm 72. Maybe do that for your devotions this noon or later on today to see how these words of this psalm are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Psalm 72 is a psalm, it, we're told, of Solomon. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. He will judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. The mountains will bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. He will defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. He will crush the oppressor. He will endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon through all generations. He will be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days the righteous will flourish, prosperity will abound till the moon is no more. He will rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The desert tribes will bow before him and his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of distant shores will bring tribute to him. The kings of Sheba and Seba will present him gifts. All kings will bow down to him and all nations will serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live, may gold from Sheba be given to him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. Let grain abound throughout the land, and the tops of the hills may it sway. Let its fruit flourish like Lebanon, let it thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. All nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends of Jesus, over the last number of weeks, our worship has really focused on confession and lament. And we repeated to ourselves the reality that we are sinful, we're confused, we're hurting, we're far away from God, and we can't get back on track on our own. And all of those things are important, they're critically important truths to realize as Christians, as those who come to worship during Lent in the hopes of a journey toward God, a journey which we remember this week includes the cross just as much as it includes the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. But sooner or later, in the midst of confession, we begin to ask ourselves, well, what's the solution? What's the good news? Where do we go from here? In the face of all of these challenges of sin and all of the all-too-real difficulties of life that we feel in front of us these days, we find ourselves looking for hope, for rescue, for deliverance. And it's in these kinds of circumstances that Psalm 72 speaks. It is, it seems, a prayer of sorts to be used at the coronation, the crowning of a new king. Most likely at Solomon's own coronation, perhaps written by his father David, maybe written by Solomon himself, maybe written for future kings to use as well. But as a song for the crowning of a new king, the beginning of a new era in the nation's life, it offers a vision for the kind of kingdom God's people would yearn for, the kind of community that we long to be in the church as well. A community, the first verse tells us, of justice, a community of righteousness, a community, as the psalm will go on to say, of care for those in need. And Psalm 72 prompts us to ask what kind of a ruler, what kind of a deliverer, what kind of a rescuer can lift us out of our present circumstances, 
our sin and our, and our misery and bring us to a place of grace and relief as well. The first verse is really an opening prayer for God's justice and righteousness to reign in the king's heart. Put these qualities of yours in his heart, O God, it prays. And then the psalmist goes on in the next and really in the body of the psalm, almost until the very end, to imagine three things. The character, the scope, the impact of a community that is changed by the effort of God's heart, God's work in his servant's heart. Character, scope, and impact. We see, first of all, character. The character of this community, the character of its leader in the few first few verses of the psalm. God's justice and righteousness helped the king, we're told in verse 2, to judge with the same justice and righteousness that God himself displays to us. It's good news, right? As forgiven sinners, it's good news to know that that same kind of quality can be reflected in the way that we live towards others. And these qualities of justice and righteousness, though, we see are in place regardless of the influence or the status of the people that the king is dealing with. The king's not just concerned only about the privileged and the powerful, but verse 4 tells us he's concerned with those who are afflicted and needy, those who are sick, those who are weak, those who are frightened, those who have no resources to help. The community of God's people, in other words, is the kind of place where the weak are not allowed to become the prey of the strong. It's the kind of place where we see things happening like those that have come on the news in the last week or two. The kind of place where neighbors volunteer to bring groceries to elderly neighbors that they've never met simply because they know that they're stuck in the house. Or maybe the kind of place where a GoFundMe, like a GoFundMe campaign in Seattle that raised $100,000 a few weeks ago for laid-off service workers. These things are the kinds of good news stories that we hear in the midst of all of the dark news that are around us these days. But when God's Spirit is present, these things are seen to be happening as a rule, not just as an exception in the time of crisis. And it's this kind of generosity of spirit that leads to the prosperity of the community, not just to a few, but to the whole community as the vulnerable in society, including its children. Isn't it interesting? Psalm 72 talks about kids. And not just any kids, but the children of the needy. Now, kids are vulnerable anyhow, right? If something were to happen to your parents, I mean, how are kids going to feed and clothe themselves? They don't have jobs. They, don't, they don't, can't earn money. They don't pay for housing. But the children of the needy, the children of families where there's already kind of living on the edge financially, God even cares about them. His ruler, his people care about them. And when we care about the uh, people, everybody around us in that way, the prosperity of the community is protected and oppressors are defeated. When you look around at the world that we live in, it's hard not to long for a rescuer with this kind of character as we look not just at the virus concerns, but as the, at the poverty and the hunger and the injustice that we find around us in the world today, to long for a rescuer with this kind of character. But as we all know too well, and especially in a democracy where we're constantly having elections and voting people in and out of office, people of character don't always last. Leadership can change, and good kings and good governors and good presidents can be replaced with bad ones. The psalm is written in the context of David and Solomon, at least that's what the title tells us. And David and Solomon reigned in the golden era of Israel's history, 40 years apiece or so their their reigns were at a time uh, when, yes, they had their failings, but overall it was a time of peace and prosperity for the nation, a time of security. But after two generations of glory, Israel was divided after Solomon's death and became open to the oppression of its neighbors. And so it's natural to want a community that only, not only is represented by character, but that has the scope to endure, to last. Where the righteous and just king, in the words of verse 5, endures as long as the sun, as long as the moon we see, too, what the scope is. It's like rain falling on a mown field. Now, that's an agricultural metaphor. Not many of us here in this community are, are in farming. But we can picture what this means anyhow, right? You know, this, this freshness and new life that the psalmist sees in a society that's ruled by the righteous and just monarch. And this isn't just a localized thing. It's not spotty showers here and there. The dream in verse 8 is that this rule is extended from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That is, over every place of the B.C. era Israelite imagination could take them. 
They spoke of Tarshish and Sheba, these places in the, in the psalm. And the way that we might speak about China or Timbuktu is kind of shorthand for places that are far away from us. Places we'll probably never get to. But places over which the reign of the righteous and just king, God's reign really, would be extended as well. And the influence here envisioned by the psalmist isn't a reward for righteousness. It's not, hey, I want the enemies to, to, you know, to kiss my feet, so to speak, so that I can show them who is boss. No, rather it's an opportunity to spread the impact of God's grace and justice, God's righteousness to new realms and to peoples that we have never met, that we've never even seen, but who need to know the goodness of God. The scope of the righteous ruler's impact is worldwide. And again, as we think about all the crises that humanity faces, it's hard not to long for a rescuer whose impact, whose scope is worldwide. And then we come to the effect, the impact of such a reign, beginning in verse 12. What we're told there is that the vulnerable and voiceless have someone who hears them. People who are lonely and kind of on the outside have somebody to sit and listen to them. Those who are poor and needy are protected from being taken advantage of. And again, you know, there's plenty of ways to be taken advantage of, especially when you're all by yourself, Right? But the poor and needy are not taken advantage of. In fact, just the opposite. They are seen as valuable and precious, the psalm says. Those who are under this king's rule desire his good so that they too may share in his prosperity. As he succeeds, they see, so do they. As he flourishes, so do the people around him. And the psalmist concludes with this great promise that God gave to Abraham, quoting it in verse 17 from Genesis 12. All nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. And again, wouldn't you want to see a community that can have that kind of a worldwide impact? A place where people are taken care of. I think that sounds pretty appealing. Wouldn't you love to be free from a world of fear and uncertainty and failure? Wouldn't you love to live in a way that naturally pushes you to do what is right, what is just, what is good, where you'd never have to confess doing something wrong because you would naturally want to do what is right. I would. I think especially in uncertain times like the ones that we live in, we long for this. In the words of a recent Atlantic piece, right now the luckiest among us can keep ourselves safe. Jobs online, kids home from school, social obligations deferred to an indeterminate future. But others have had their lives and livelihoods upended as jobs evaporate. And they go home abruptly and with little indication of how they can pay next month's bills. Still others get pressed into precarious duty as de facto first responders to a tragedy that yet has yet to fully materialize. The rapidity of which things keep changing is hard to wrap your head around. And what's going to get us out of this, we ask. You know, sometimes we look at one solution or one proposal, and we, we want to cheer this, or we want to, you know, kind of tamp that one down. There's plenty of analysis of state and federal leaders and their responses, but the reality is that as human beings, we are constantly faced with competing desires. Should we be concerned about health or about the economy? What's right? What's just? And how do we find someone who can figure it all out, just the right combination to keep us safe from everything that we fear. And on Palm Sunday, the people of Jerusalem welcomed a prophetic figure through their city gates who they felt would rescue them from their fears, their problems, their concerns. They saw a king who would save them from the injustice of Roman rule. Rulers a thousand miles away who didn't care at all what was going on in the poor in Jerusalem. They saw someone who would save them from the betrayal of their unrighteous internal leadership. Someone who would save them from those among the powerful and privileged who kept the little people from succeeding. And so they shouted, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And I'm guessing that as they said those words, not at least a few of them had something in their minds of Psalm 72. Prosperity abounding to the moon is no more. Far-flung nations under their sway. The gold of Sheba in their coffers. Grain abounding throughout the land and so on. A king had come. 
One who would set things right. One who would restore proper worship of God. One who would gather the community of God's people. Yes, so that they could be a blessing again to the whole earth. And you know what? Jesus had come to do those things. He had come to set sin and wrong right. He had come to restore proper relationship with God so that we could worship before him again without fear. He had come to gather all of God's people in peace so that we could be a blessing to the whole earth once again. Jesus came to do every one of those things that they dreamed about. He just came to do them in a way that the people of Jerusalem could never have expected that day. That we would not have expected had we been in the crowd that day. Why? Because we never expect prosperity to come through pain and hardship. We never expect triumph to come through suffering. We never expect forgiveness to come through injustice. You know, those who welcome Jesus as the king, the rescuer on Palm Sunday, could never envision a rescue that demanded a cross just a few days later. But that was God's plan for Jesus, for the king, for the rescuer. It was his plan for us. See, as much as Psalm 72 is a prayer about the Israelite kingdom, the Israelite nation, as I said at the beginning of the sermon, it's long been understood as a prayer for God to provide the rescuer that we really need. A prayer for the Messiah to come. The rescuer that we can never find, that we can never elect, that we can't appoint for ourselves. It's a prayer for the Savior, the only one who could fulfill that answer, to be the answer to the prayer in verse 1. Who could really be endowed with God's justice and with God's righteousness. On Palm Sunday, we confess that even our greatest hopes and fears, hopes and dreams fall short of displaying the righteousness and justice of God to the entire earth. That as much as we want that, we are always colored by our own selfishness that pits us against them, that pits health against economics, that pits my comfort and safety against the comfort and safety of those around us. And even when we try to welcome the Savior into our midst, our minds still can't imagine that part of the rescue that we need is to be rescued from ourselves. Scott Jose points out our election slogans. Play right into this, right? Our election slogans tell us over and over that we are people who can make ourselves better and all we need is somebody who can, who can empower us to do it ourselves. Yes, we can. Enthuses the crowd, right? Make America great. But when you get to the prayer of this psalm, yes, we can be just and make America righteous. Don't sell politically in quite the same way. They don't resonate with the desire of the human heart, with what we think we want, anyhow. Our vision, our hearts, just can't quite get to where God would lead us to be. And that's why in the closing verses of the psalm, we're confronted not with the leader of our dreams, with the king on the throne, but we are presented with God himself. We're told in verse 18 that God alone does marvelous deeds. It is his name that should be honored forever. It is his glory which we desire to see fill the whole earth. As one Christian leader reminded evangelicals a few years back, the kingdom of God does not arrive on Air Force One. See, it's only God who has the character and the scope and the impact to ultimately reshape history. Only God who has the ability to reshape us. And it's why God had to come himself in the person of Jesus Christ to show us what the righteous and just leader, the one who exhibits the righteousness and justice of God, what he looks like. See, when we look to God to fulfill our hopes and dreams, when we apply his righteousness and justice to our lives for the purpose of making ourselves healthy and successful, we miss the point of a relationship with him. When we look to the leadership of human beings as our ultimate rescue, any human being, even one with the greatest intentions, we fail to recognize that we need a savior who has a claim on our lives, on our hearts. We need to recognize our need for rescue from the systems of injustice and unrighteousness that infect us all. The prayer in the Psalms first verse ought to transport us, not to the leader who we think might fulfill the psalm's vision for a great king. Rather, the first verse ought to bring us 
to the vision of God in the psalm's closing verses, a God who alone can rescue and implant justice and righteousness in the human heart. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we stop working for righteousness and justice here and now. We should be doing the kinds of things that the church is doing now. Feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, expressing concern about what would happen if the climate were to change. We should be doing at least as much to concern about the coronavirus and refugee camps or on children who now have to spend all day in abusive and neglected homes. We have to make sure that our food pantries are well stocked so that we don't face food insecurity, if people who face food insecurities don't go hungry. We should be doing what we're trying to do now as a church community, finding out how each other are doing, running errands for those who can't get out. But we also remember that this is not the whole of the church's mission. That all of these things should help us to point toward God, toward Jesus Christ, as the one who came to reflect the splendor of God in less than splendid circumstances. Because ultimately what Psalm 72 longs for is the day when God's kingdom is all in all, even if that kingdom has to come through a cross, as we remember this week. In the midst of uncertainty, where do we go from here? What is the good news? You know, on Palm Sunday, nobody could have imagined that the good news was that the king that they welcomed that day would willingly give up his life just a few days later. No one could have imagined that a suffering servant would be the means by which God initiated the kingdom of righteousness and justice for which humanity has always dreamed. No one could have imagined that in a crown of thorns, the splendor of God could be seen. No one could have imagined the ways in which God appears in the greatest tragedies, the greatest injustice, the greatest uncertainty to bring about redemption and forgiveness. But Palm Sunday calls us to prepare for the unexpected because it is in weakness that God's strength is revealed. And it calls us to look for God's word, God's glory as our final hope. And that seems like a pretty good place to conclude not only this psalm, but as the text suggests in verse 20, a whole collection of psalms, a whole collection of songs that were to be sung by the people of God to praise God and to understand his ways. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. For it is finally only in the glory of God that we humans have hope of a rescue, a deliverer, a king who would lead us beyond our frail hopes, beyond even death, into a place of changed hearts and lives. Let's pray. Almighty God, heavenly king, we praise you and we give you our thanks for you rule over this world in such a way that as we confess, nothing, nothing comes to us by chance, but only from your fatherly hand. Extend your rule, Lord, until every knee bows and every tongue confesses you as sovereign over all. And increase your rule in our hearts too, King Jesus, so that your divine power brings us to recognize the places in lives where even our good intentions fall short of your glory. Replace the selfishness and pride with your righteousness and justice and way we live as instruments of your good rule through the power of your spirit. And Lord, may the whole earth be seen to be filled with your glory, even, Lord, in circumstances like those we face now, circumstances like the cross, too, where it didn't seem that you were glorious. Lord, show us your face this week. In Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.